Hello and good evening. My name is Jason Lenetsky and as director of the Anderson Collection at Stanford University, it's my great pleasure to welcome you for the second in a three-part series of programs with visual artist Eamon Ore Hiron. I'm thrilled to be here, grateful to our guest, and thankful to all of you for joining us here tonight. Before we begin, captioning is available for this program. Please click on the caption icon at the bottom, CC, to start viewing captioning. The up arrow adjacent to the CC icon allows you to show subtitles, view the full transcript, and adjust captions as needed. I would also like to take a moment to recognize that Stanford sits on the territory of Weichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Muekma Ohlone tribe, who are the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native people. Eamon Ore Hiron has been awarded Stanford's 2020 2021 Presidential Residency for the Future of the Arts. Eamon was invited by and is hosted by the Anderson Collection at Stanford University and our wonderful campus partners, the Institute for Diversity in the Arts. We are all honored to be collaborating with Eamon and providing him access to the rich intellectual resources of Stanford's community. Throughout the academic year, we will present programs, workshops, and other forms of public and private engagement with Eamon and our campus community. Quite excitedly, this residency will culminate in an exhibition of R.A. Heron's work in spring 2021, giving new context to both his practice and the Anderson Collection. Last week, Eamon treated us to a dynamic and thought-provoking conversation with Edgar Garcia on the material, history, and symbolism of gold, a color that features prominently in Eamon Ore Hiron's ongoing series of infinite regress paintings. Our guests then shared ideas on how we might begin to decolonize and reclaim this precious metal, honor and represent erased traditions, and ascribe new value to aesthetics and form. If you missed that conversation, do make time to watch the recording of it on the Anderson Collections website. Today, Eamon has invited us on yet another journey of discovery and inquiry. This one filled with music and videos that have inspired and influenced him and his artistic practice. While Eamon is a painter who received his BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and his MFA from the University of California, Los Angeles, and currently serves as assistant professor of painting and drawing at California State University, Bakersfield, he's also a musician a DJ, a filmmaker, and much, much more. The selected clips we will be introduced to today will whet our appetite for more. They're varied and diverse, ranging from incredible footage of indigenous and folkloric performances to contemporary artist videos, including one of Eamon's. I'm grateful to you, Eamon, for having create, curated this program and to all the artists who have given us permission to screen their works here tonight. My hope is these works with Eamon's insights provide ongoing inspiration and opportunities for critical conversations about the interconnectedness of our past, present, and future, and how we as a community use art to progress as a society. Stay tuned for the third program in this series on November 12th, when Eamon will return to introduce and screen a copy of the 1976 film, Chulas Fronteras, directed by Les Blank. Eamon has also generously agreed to take questions tonight from the audience. So please submit them during the program using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will have a chance to review those and discuss those with you at the end of our program. So in the tradition of providing a home for art and artists and scholars who advance dialogue on contemporary issues, I'm honored to welcome our guest Eamon Ore Hiron. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much to the Anderson Collection um, Institute for the Diversity in the Arts at Stanford. Um, thanks, Ken Hermano, for helping with the video, and Gabby and Amy 
for helping make this possible. Uh, so to begin the evening, uh, I think it's really appropriate to follow up on the conversation with Edgar that you mentioned, Jason, um, about gold and about the history of gold. And it made me think about the history of uh, the way culture is disseminated in Latin America and the way that there's deeper knowledges that, that kind of uh, transcend our contemporary time, I guess. Um, so just to give you some background, uh, my musical background, a lot of it comes from my exposure to sonidero culture in Mexico. Uh, when I lived in Mexico in the early to mid 90s, uh, I was exposed to a sound system culture called sonidero music. And uh, the sound systems in Mexico were to me what I what I found the most interesting and most inspiring was the way that they were more focused on musicians and a whole kind of cosmology of music that was based in South America, in Colombia and in Peru. Um, and being Peruvian, you know, that was also like an added kind of element to my interest in the fact that this music would make its way up to a place like Mexico City and that people would put so much importance on it. Um, so that's kind of the context in which my, my musical kind of persona, my, like my producer persona comes out of uh, DJ Lengua is part of that, it, 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 not part of it, it is that. And, um, and so the more that I learned about the record collecting community in Mexico, the more I learned about Peru, the more I learned about Colombia and the history of the music there. A lot of it I was already familiar with, um, you know, growing up with my Peruvian family being exposed to certain types of music, winos and, and different types of music like that. But, but I think the Sonidero culture kind of, uh, it opened more doors and more connections for me. Um, so tonight, what, what I want to show you guys, um, I also just really briefly too want to talk because I, I know we, each one of these videos and each one of these films, you know, I could talk an hour about individually and, and we have quite a, a few pieces to go through. But um, I wanted to also talk about my video work. And at the end of this, this program, I'll be showing bite work, which kind of ties in a lot of these inspirations, ties in a lot of these ideas about that type of uh, deeper sense of time and deeper sense of, of culture uh, and what it is to be uh, Latin American, what it is to be indigenous, what it is to be contemporary, and um, all of that, that what that, what that kind of uh, pertains. So the first film that I wanna show you guys, the first clips that I wanna show you is from a band called Los Chapis. Um, we can hold that real quick, uh, Ken. And Los Chapis, to give you some background, Los Chapis uh, is a chicha band. And the music essentially is kind of like taking the framework of the Waino music from the highlands of Peru and modernizing it and, you know, putting it, running it through like electric guitars and keyboards and different effects. And this type of music was very much associated with people coming down from the mountains into Lima, Peru. And it was at a time in which there was a lot of social upheaval. There was uh, the Shining Path, which was a Maoist organization, uh, a guerrilla uprising, was, was gaining a lot of momentum. And so there was a lot of, I think one of the main things between the first two films that I wanna show you, Chulas Fronteras and this film, Los Chapis um, and El Mundo de los Pobres is this idea of the rural coming to the urban and the rural being um, kind of threatening the way of the urban. And I think 
what I'll show you in these clips. The first clip is what I refer to as the gringo uh, record executive. And this band, Los Shoppies, was the first kind of crossover band. They were the first band to really make it um, showcasing their, their Andean roots, showcasing that where they were from and being proud of it. And they represented the people that were coming down from the mountains. And so um, to me, this film really opened my eyes in a lot of ways to the potential for music to be a form of, uh, rep of resistance and a form to, to represent like um, the, the unrepresented essentially in Peru. So we'll go ahead and play this. In this clip, you'll see the, the, the record executive, the gringo record executive, and he's disgusted with the, the music that he's hearing, but you'll see that. Um, there's no subtitles, unfortunately. Señor Jefferson. Señorita. Aquí está el señor que lo buscaba. Que pase. Adelante. Gracias. Asiento, por favor. So here comes their, their representative trying to sell the album. He's trying to get production and distribution. Mi secretaria me ha dicho que usted tiene un gran negocio para mí. Vamos a ver de qué sí. se trata. Mire, señor Jefferson. Está en meeting with the executive. Aló, sí. See? Hi, V. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything is okay, right? <laughs> yeah, I know you. Remember this dude, bro? We fuck? <laughs> I know you guys. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll be there next week. Don't worry about it. Okay, bye. Bueno, a ver, ¿de qué se trata? Mire, señor Jefferson, se trata de algo nuevo. A ver. So here he's holding up the, the master tape. He's trying to get... He's trying to get the record executive on his side. ¿Qué es esto? Lo sabe, señor Jefferson. Le gusta. Oiga, usted está loco o no sabe en qué lugar se encuentra. Por si no lo sabe, la moña musical es subsidiaria de la empresa de discos más grande del mundo. ¿Usted cree que yo puedo perder cinco minutos de mi valiosísimo tiempo para que me venga a hablar de los chapis? ¿Usted está loco o no sabe en qué lugar se encuentra? Ya sé, señor Jefferson, no es necesario que me lo recuerde. Ya sé que usted es el magnate de la moña musical. Pero yo le vengo a traer algo nuevo. Algo para que se pudre en plata. A mí no me va a enseñar usted cómo regir mi negocio. Mire, no me quiero ir antes de decirle lo que pienso de usted. Usted es un gringo que no sabe de nuestra ¿Y eso música. ¿Qué me importa? Hablaba en inglés, en francés, nada más. Pero esta es música nuestra. Oiga, ¿Usted eso sabe dónde estamos? Estamos en el Perú. Pero, a, es, oiga, esta oiga fuera de aquí. Nuestra. Fuera. ¿Qué tal, son of a bitch? Fue pa'guagua. You motherfucker. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. All right, so that's the first clip in this film, which, uh, which I'm presenting tonight, Los Chapis and El Mundo de los Pobres, which translates in the world of the poor. Um, this film, in that clip, what, he's, what the promoter is doing is he's trying to sell it to the big record exec. Um, and this, type of music that they're playing 
it, it represents more than just a stylistic difference. It represents a class difference. And in that, um, cla in that clip, you really see very clearly what, what they're up against, who they're trying to please to get a big record deal. So what they end up doing, it's a very long film. I, I don't have time to get into it too much because we'll keep moving on. But um, what he ends up finding is a cool kind of rock and roll guy who ends up produce, giving him studio time to produce the record. Um, so this next clip, which is them in the studio recording, they finally get their recording time. And, um, and it, it kind of, it shows them recording, it's the tail end of them recording, and then a vignette of the rough street life that they live in Lima, Peru at that time. And this was 1986, 1987, I believe. So yeah, there we go.
Bueno, seguimos presentando los mejores éxitos musicales en esta emisora. Ay, 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 esta emisora que se pasa cualquier cantidad. Y como les había prometido mi, mi querida chochera, mi, mi gente linda, ya tenemos en nuestros estudios a Los Chapis, uno de los grupos musicales que se va imponiendo con su ritmo, que no es ni chicha ni libonada. <risa> bueno, 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 es un ritmo, la verdad, la verdad, mentira, mentira, la verdad, es un ritmo que se pasa y es por eso que ha conquistado a todos los lorchos del planeta Tierra y a todos los lorchos que están en la luna como mi compadre Dalmacio ese. Mi compadre, oh, hermano, ya no me estoy rayando los discos La disquera ya no me quiere entregar discos Ya cree que me la estoy cutreando Estoy sacándome la mía Pero tú bien contento y feliz de la vida Moviendo su perilla, él no le interesa nada Bueno, como le está diciendo pues mi compadre Almacio Rayando los discos Y ahora vamos a presentar pues Para que todos ustedes conozcan a los Chapis Y eso que recién están empezando ¿Es así o no, Chapulín? Mira hermanito, nosotros estamos rayando como locos Estamos rayando con los microbuseros Con los vendedores ambulantes Con los mozos con los trabajadores, con los estudiantes, con los profesionales cholos de nuestro querido Perú. Claro. Dime, Chapulín, ¿eres soltero, casado? Las chicas quieren saber, ¿eres soltero, casado, viudo, divorciado, con hijos, sin hijos, con sucursal? No te vaciles, ya te va a tocar a ti también, compadre. So, that's, that clip shows you the street life. It shows you where they're coming from. Um, at the end, it's like, it's kind of the, um, the eye of the tiger moment, you know, they, they go from the recording studio, the records getting pressed, and then the scene that they really come from, the scene that they really live in. Um, in that reality um, is the idea of the cholo, and the cholo in Peru, very different than, not very different, but, but somewhat different than the, than the American Cholo, than the Mexican Cholo. The Peruvian Cholo is basically the person that's come down from the mountains, that, that's come down to live in the city. Um, I think another really important thing about that clip is the song. I know it's difficult with the, those clips. There's no, uh, there's no subtitles, but essentially, the song that he's singing is, this is my work, así es mi trabajo. Like, I, I work out in the street and I'm not doing, I, I shouldn't be, it's not, it shouldn't be criminalized. So essentially a lot of uh, cholos, a lot of people that had come down from the mountains were uh, marginalized when they went to Lima. And so this music represented them. And at that time, the the character of a city like Lima was transforming a lot like what was happening in Mexico City in the 80s as well. Um, in Peru, what was happening was a lot of the, the Andean music and Andean influence was coming down. But at the same time, that music was being affected by the urbanism of, of Lima. And that's where you get the music that Los Chapis make. And that's where you get an incredible film like Los Chapis that actually really focuses and, and shows it in very plain view, the dynamics um, that, that a band like Los Chapis was up against. Um, so in that Eye of the Tiger moment, you know, they show the, 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 the really rough and tumble neighborhoods that these guys are from, that they're living in then they show them at the radio station getting all the love and at the end he says um they chicha is a music named after a fermented corn drink called chicha um that's why he says ni chicha ni limonada like we're, we're selling this out like crazy um and he asks him you know he says who is this for and he and and chapulin the little short guy the lead singer uh, his name Chapulín El Querido. Um, he he gives a shout out to all the people that the music is for, the ambulantes, the proletarians. And this was a very interesting time in Peru where, where there was definitely a political awakening based around labor and about migration within the country. Um, so speaking to that migration, um, you know, when I put this playlist together, this video playlist together, I couldn't help but think of Chulas Fronteras, which is a film uh, made that was made in 1970, I believe six, I think, uh, 74, 76. Um, and it is 
reflecting the migration in the United States and Mexico along the Mexico US border. And it's a really beautiful, beautiful document of the Tex-Mex music. And for me, I think it informed a lot of my sensibilities. I think when the first time that I saw it, it spoke to me as a Tucsonan, as somebody from Arizona. It spoke to me um, as somebody who believes in that, that power of music as a form of resistance on some levels, not always, but on some levels that there are, there, there are expressions of, that, that can get to the political point of the time. And so Chula Fronteras for me was a, was a really, really beautiful eye-opening experience. Um, I had the pleasure of working at the Bay Area Video Coalition uh, in the late 90s. And, and um, I had been exposed to Chula Fronteras before that, but I, I bring up the Bay Area Video Coalition because I think in a lot of ways, my practice was informed from working there and, and being around a lot of independent, it, it provided the Bay Area Video Coalition provided um, a very cheap um, uh, post production for documentary filmmakers. So I learned a lot there. Um, and Les Blank, I think to me is kind of a hero to, to that community. Um, Les Blank lived in Berkeley and he also had a deep interest in Peruvian music and wino music. So when I saw Chula Fronteras, you know, a lot of those things aligned for me was um, seeing Les Blank's kind of love for for Mexican culture, for Mexican border culture, also Peruvian culture, and his understanding, his sensibility. So in this clip that I'm gonna show you from Chulas Fronteras is a, um, it's a song by, uh, it's, it's a song entitled uh, The Texas Rangers, Los Rangers of Texas. This is subtitled, so you will understand this part um, if you don't speak Spanish. And the very beginning is a radio station on the border um, being, uh, showing you kind of border life and life along the frontera. The film, we will be uh, showing the full length film in the next part of this series. Hola amigos, muy buenos y santos días tengan todos y cada uno de ustedes. Hola micrófono de XOR de Reynosa, Tamaulipas, México. Que inicia el programa Chula Frontera del Norte para presentar a ustedes música alegre, regional, ranchera, norteña, popular y bonita como a ustedes les gusta. Así como también a mí. 6 de la mañana, 33 minutos, hora de México, son las 7.33 en Texas. Esperamos desde luego que ya nos estén escuchando, que se levanten con mucho ánimo y con un saludo cordial para todos ustedes de parte de nuestros patrocinadores, que son personas muy finas, muy dignas y con ganas de servirle. Pablo Gracia de Inborgo es el taller mecánico independiente donde siempre todo el mundo sale muy contento. Cuando quiere usted un buen automóvil usado en perfectas condiciones, háblese con Felipe López, el propietario. Está a sus órdenes por la salida de San Antonio en el número 1102 antes de salir del pueblo, pasando las bodegas empacadoras en la mera orilla del segundo camino de fierro. No tiene problema si usted tiene buen crédito, y si no tiene buen crédito, no le eche la culpa a nadie. ¿Se recuerda de este disco? ¿Recuerda de este corrido? ¿Recuerda usted la huelga de Río Grande? Aquí están los Rinches de Texas. <música> Decía 
So that's Chulas Fronteras. Um, the music that they're playing there is uh, called corridos. And corridos are specifically um, songs written to tell a story, um, mostly about contemporary events. Um, and so to me, they're, they're listening to that corrido and thinking about um, you know, the, the ability for it to speak to the people that don't have a voice, um, I think is, is, was very impactful on my practice and, and overall, um, you see a lot of that, um, existing currently in terms of, um, that type of corrido music, um, expressing a lot of, of what's currently happening um, with the, the, the issues that are important along the border. Um, so the next video that I'm gonna play is entitled Inverted Star. Um, Inverted Star is by a good friend of mine, Miguel Calderon. He lives in Mexico City. This film was, I believe, yeah, it's from like 2002. Um, and it seems to, I feel like it was made earlier, but it says 2002. Um, and it, it was shot on video. Miguel, to me, has always been beyond our friendship. He's always been somebody that inspires me in terms of when I pick up a camera, I think about the way that he approaches um, thematics and his subject. And um, this piece of video is a bit kind of guerrilla. It's not very, uh, um, it, it, it's very unplanned. And he put out an ad asking people um, if they have been possessed by Satan. And it's a perfect video for the Halloween season. Um, and people that responded, he went and filmed. So we'll go ahead and play that. Seis, 
So that was Miguel Calderon, Inverted Star. Um, like to me, I think what, what really has always inspired me by Miguel's work has been his, his rawness. Um, he's not trying to make something that is palatable a lot of times. Um, and he's playing with social dynamics there in that film that I, that I find really interesting. Um, he, his, his vision has kind of um, refined itself in terms of filmmaker. And so this next clip is, is a film that he made in, uh, I believe, 2018, Camarillon, which translates to Chameleon. And it's the story of a nightclub bouncer. Um, and it's interesting because when I made the video that I will show at the very end of this, this presentation, Bite Work, um, I really see the affinity that we have for certain styles of long shots and kind of to try to get into the psychology of the viewer and the, the subject. Um, I think another thing that we both share in terms of um, the, the, these videos, it introduces the element of violence and violence as something that is universal. Um, violence that is something that is somewhat like fetishized in Latin American culture, um, not entirely, not uniquely to Latin American culture, but these are unique visions into that. Um, and I think Miguel really captures that well. In this video, he, um, he follows a nightclub bouncer in Mexico City that also uses uh, falcons for, he, he practices falconry. Um, and it's a beautiful kind of homage to this person that is misunderstood on some levels, um, but also volatile. Um, so we'll watch that clip right now. Lo que me pasa es violento, siempre. Algo hago violento. Tengo 274 cicatrices en todo el cuerpo. Tengo 15, 17 cirugías. Traigo dos balazos. Llevo 29 años trabajando en, en antros.
Mi papá fue parte del servicio secreto. Se vestía como Elliot Ness. Traje de tres piezas. En aquella época se usaban sombreros. Y dice que se ponía en el espejo a sacar la pistola cada rato. Me dejó a los siete años, me dolió, no sabes. Lo vi a los 23. En vez de saludarme con gusto, yo lo quería abrazar y me regaña porque me rapo. El último año ya me empecé a llevar con él. Y ya me empezaba a contar él muchas cosas que, que hacía. Las torturas que hacían. De los clásicos toques en los huevos. La bolsa en la cabeza con chile piquín. En Tehuacanazo. Um, yeah, that's a powerful video by Miguel Calderón. Um, I think in the comments you can see um, there's a link that Margaret Tedesco, um, hi Margaret, that you uh, posted up there. I guess for a limited time you can see the whole film. Um, so following that theme, um, I think some of the things that that kind of ring through it all and some of the things that kind of make me think about how they relate to the piece by work in particular and my approach towards that film and that video is um, that the thematic of, of violence and um, the 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 thematic of violence and folklore and violence and, and culture, um, how they, they go hand in hand in, in certain regards. Um, I think that in his film, he, he speaks to that, he speaks to this person that's hired to kind of be this buffer zone and to kind of um, be this, this uh, I guess, kind of function as this bouncer, literally, to bounce people out of the club. But, you know, a lot of things stick on him. A lot of things stick onto his psychology. Um, he's not so uh, repellent, after all. Um, so the next film, Crudo, is by Miguel Angel Rios. He's a video artist, just overall amazing artist from Argentina. Um, he, again, just to kind of bring it back to that thematic of like the rural and the urban, um, uh, Miguel Angel Rios was originally from a small town in Argentina and moved to the, the city to become an artist. And then later now, I think, splits his time between Mexico City and New York. And his work, you know, he revisits these ideas of kind of that, that rural life that he lived as a child and, and the folkloric kind of elements that, that comprised his life when he was, when he was uh, living there. So Crudo is a piece that was made prior to bite work but I had not seen it. And then when I finally saw it, there were just so many connections that it was undeniable that we were on the same wavelength. Um, so this is a clip from his film Crudo, which all of these we will have up online. So you'll be able to see the full uh, versions of them, um, except for the Shapis and the, the Chula Fronteras because Chula Fronteras will be screening next week or in I think two weeks. Um, I don't have the date in front of me, but, um, and Los Shapis film, you can actually find that uh, in El Mundo de los Pobres, you can find that on YouTube. Uh, so this next one is Crudo, and it depicts a folkloric dance um, from Argentina done traditionally by the gauchos, by the, the cowboys. And instead of using, um, the um, boleros, I think, uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, the bolas that they use to, to, to 
capture the cattle with they that they throw to kind of tie around their legs they the dancer is using two pieces of meat and um and he's being attacked by dogs while he's dancing this So that's Miguel Angel Rios. Um, so that idea of the folkloric and violent um, things that I that I touched on right before the clip. Um, the I think I chose this playlist thinking about um, ways in which the folkloric exists in my work, ways in which I view the folkloric. Um, and they they don't always exist in this this certain paradigm, but the this is the the focus of of these playlists. And I think one thing that I connected to with Miguel Angel Rios and Crudo in particular was I had already been thinking about this kind of idea of of um, cultures is the especially in Latin America. It's always kind of born out of this kind of initial. Uh, moment of 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 uh, pain, I guess the the conquest, um, and so it it kind of spreads out throughout the folkloric in so many different ways. Um, so because of time, we'll we'll kind of move kind of quickly. Um, the next video clip is a video clip of the Yaki in Sonora. Um, which is the state just south of Arizona, where I grew up. And um, there, these, this dance is called, um, well, it's not a dance, it's a procession. Um, and it is, it takes place during Easter. Um, so we'll go ahead and play it and I'll speak over it. The guards in the front are body sales and they, this ritual is all based around the stations to the cross and Easter. Um, the Yaqui in Mexico, they, their, their traditional homeland is in Sonora. And the city of Sonora, capital. Um, and they were a tribe, they are a tribe that were persecuted by the Mexican federal government. And it forced a large part of the tribe to move into Arizona. And so I think something that the Yaki represents in a lot of ways is the Mexican border. There's these characters are called the Japanese characters.
That was the Yaki uh, Chapayecas. That is a ceremony that occurs during Easter. Um, and they do a reenactment, essentially, of the um, Stations of the Cross and of the capturing of Jesus. Um, it's in Yaki culture called the Quaresma. And um, for me, what's, what's the way it ties in a lot to, to the work that I make um, was, you know, be, growing up in Arizona, seeing a lot of the, the yaki ceremonies, um, it really connected to me in terms of certain ways of reenacting um, the, 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 the combination of indigenous uh, ritual with the European and the Catholic um, imposition of, of the religion. Um, the next uh, clips that we'll see are from Peru, and it's from a dance called the Chonginada, which is where uh, my father's family is from in the Mantaro Valley. This is specifically, this is a Chonginada from Huancayo, and um, it is kind of a reenaction, a reenactment of the kind of a satire on the Spanish and the vice royalty. And each character in this Chonginada kind of plays a specific role in terms of um, reenacting elements of structure, the structure of society in colonial Spain, in colonial Latin America. <laughs> That's the Chonginada from, from Peru. Um, I think for purposes of time, we'll move ahead to La Guitarra Ayacuchana. Um, one quick thing I'll say about the Chonginada, if you saw the characters, um, you had the kind of burlesque uh, of, of, or the, the um, kind of satire of the Spanish with um, the, the rosy cheeks and the little mustache and the blue eyes. 
and all the pomp and circumstance that they're the way that they're dancing the minuet which which comes from like a certain period of time in Europe and the women that are wearing this kind of triangular um, uh, scar uh, uh, capes I guess I, I I'm trying to think of the English word mantas they they represent the indigenous the what in Mexico they would refer to as the Malinche, like the the, wom the women that married into the Spanish crown. And then the strange character that you see dancing around with that kind of whip and the strange mask, he's called, um, he's called El, El Chunto. And he is, uh, yeah, Ken, video 09, I think for, for purposes of time, we'll just skip the next Chonginada video. But he, interestingly, is, is interpreted as the mestizo. He is this kind of um, chameleon in some ways. He is, he's able to kind of be um, a trickster in these two identities. And he's the product of, of both of that union. Um, so we'll move on i'm going to show a video um speaking of this kind of blending of musical styles i think that's the thematic of the night in a lot of ways is um kind of taking this indigenous structure musical structure and blending it and kind of imposing it onto the european instruments that they were that they that was imposed upon them um this is a video that i shot in 2001 in um, in Huancayo, Peru, and it is of a friend of mine, Rudy Felices, and he is playing a song that he wrote during the um, during the time of terrorism in the '80s, um, and he mentions that really quickly. Uh, just a quick reminder: um, submit your your questions if you want in the Q and A um, for the discussion after. And yeah, so we'll play this. Rudy Felices, he's playing La Guitarra Ayacuchana. <laughs> esto en época del terrorismo cuando hay mucho hervir sangre digamos no mucho mucha matanza y más o menos la música voy a tocarlo para dedicártelo a ti Emma. Uh, 
you can really see it took a lot out of him. Um, so that's Rudy Felices. Um, that's a video that I shot back in 2001. He was a guitar teacher of mine, a friend of my uncle's. Um, and uh, he lived through a particularly rough time um, in Peru and in Ayacucho in particular. Um, and so that music reflects that area. Um, um, so yeah, and, and to think about what he's specifically playing right there, um, he is playing kind of like a, a framework of, of indigenous uh, uh, tonal structures on top of a classical guitar. And so that's why it's, it, to me, it's just so very unique the way that he plays it and, and that particular style of, of guitar. Um, what they say, there's, all, there's a saying in Ayacucho that it's like, um, uh, I picked up my guitar, there, my, my father's instrument to play my mother's pain. Um, and, and so, and it has that kind of, um, kind of blues type of quality to it. Um, so real quick, just a quick reminder, if you want to throw some questions out, um, use the Q and A button there. Um, so the very last clip we'll show is by work, um, a piece that I made in 2011 with the help of Julio Morales, um, and, and this piece kind of is an amalgamation of like a lot of the things that I've been presenting to you tonight. Um, it is uh, thinking about ideas of violence, thinking about ideas of folklore, thinking about ideas of structures of society and this idea of the chunto being uh, the, the, the mestizo in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, that's what we'll, We'll close out the evening with, and then we'll have a Q and A.
So that was Bite Work um, from 2011. Um, like I mentioned earlier, so many of the, the, the videos that I showed, everything that I showed um, tonight has a little bit, there's a little piece of it in um, Bite Work, um, whether I knew it or not. Um, Miguel Angel Rios, his crudo video, um, Miguel Calderon's video, his approach. Um, and um, but so I want to go ahead and, and open up the Q&A and, and bring in Jason. Um, so go ahead and we'll pop in there. Hey there, Eamon. Hey. Am I there? That was fabulous. That was really amazing. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you for sharing. Thank you for presenting us um, with these films, with these sounds, um, you know, with these cultural traditions um, that I think, you know, some in the audience are familiar with, but uh, many are, are not. And I think that it really helps us sort of get, uh, you know, a deeper understanding of, of you in many ways, um, which is what um, we're all very excited about. Um, and there are, um, there are a few questions and I'm delighted that you have taken them. Um, there are also some thanks and some praise for um, you presenting the type of work that you just presented and that you just shared and sort of, um, I think in a way, getting to your comment about how these voices aren't always as represented as they should be. I think people have very much recognized the way in which you're bringing them forward and they thank you for that. Awesome. That's cool. I, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, so a question in relation to your practice, I think um, there's a question, how do these musical styles and experiences affect your Infinite Regress series? Um, and I think that, you know, you, you've sort of tied together these works, these, um, or these, these clips that you've shared with us, you know, around issues of time and rhythm, um, around issues of, you know, presenting the sort of unseen or the unheard. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think we see how bite work was very much informed by, um, by what you've shown. Um, and I think, you know, the audience is curious how th these works also in, inform your painting practice. Yeah, I mean, I think like when Edgar last week asked about time mm -hmm. and spoke about kind of a deeper mm -hmm. sense of time, mm -hmm. um, I think that's when I start to connect the music to the work. Um, this kind of idea of looking back in time and trying to understand it in a different way and in a different, in a new way. Um, and so it's nothing that it's like, I mean, I think in terms of the literal influence that it has, I think is the form reacts to 
certain rhythmic kind of um, element. And I think there's a certain rhythm to painting, you know, and I've been teaching my, my students that, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, kind of focusing on a different time, you know, and, and it's that same approach is pivotal in music. Everything is about time. Everything is about the way that the, the, that, that time reacts. One thing reacts to the other, a certain kind of um, syncopated relationship. And I think in painting, like in terms of the visual field, um, you know, these, these clips and all of this type of kind of amalgamation of, of, of influences affect affected my approach to infinite regress both from like kind of a historical standpoint but also from a i guess in that sense rhythmic approach you know to painting and mm -hmm. in you'll see in bite work the beginning is it's broken into two parts the first part is a focus on the dog and a focus on the the obstacle that the dog has to pass through and that obstacle is kind of built out of these uh, basic elemental um, forms, a rectangle, squares, a triangle, and it has to make its way through a square. Uh, and, and then in that process, it kind of rearranges that, those forms. And then the next phase is it has to jump through this kind of more amorphous object, the bags of trash with a couple rectangles on top. And so then it gets a little trickier and the dog has a little bit harder time getting through that. Um, and so, you know, I think that those type of things related to in some weird way, what I'm doing with painting is trying to kind of play with form in that way and seeing how they react to one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the geometries in your painting are, you know, echoed in bite work and I think the the palette to a certain extent those blocks of color are present in both um, you know and I think the sort of this question of time and this rhythm of um, of forms within your paintings you know yeah seems clearly informed by you know the rhythms within um, the um, the Easter dance I think as well right I mean and, and the way in which that yes has connections to European and Catholic tradition, but also sort of comes out of this maybe pagan background that if, that was inspired by celestial bodies and the movement of the sun and the earth and, um, yeah, and I think, how I think that sort of fits in. Yeah, and I think that that's like an interesting thing in terms of those dances is even in Europe, there's so much of a tie-in to how the Catholic religion was spreading throughout Europe. And there's many, many different examples in Europe of that kind of pre-Catholic influence within the ritual, you know. And in Latin America, it's just a bit more right under the surface. It's not deeply kind of, it doesn't have as long of a history with the relationship to Catholicism. So it's, it's very much, and it's also been so in resistance in so many ways to the Catholic religion. So it lies just under the surface. And with the Yaki, it's, it's right there, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with the Chominada, it's a bit more uh, nuanced. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, for the sake of time, I might move on to the next question. And I think it's, yeah. um, it's about music. Um, there's a thanks for uh, you having run somebody through their own musical and artistic influences. Um, but there's a question about the music that you listened to in your teenage years. Oh, in my teenage years? Oh, mm -hmm. God. Bringing you back a little bit. Definitely death metal. All right. um, I was very into... Yeah, I was very into early Metallica, <laughs> Master of Puppets, Ride the Lightning. Um, I would also say I was also into hip hop very early. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, was, I actually had my hip hop days before um, mm -hmm. my metal days. Um, and then just a lot of like uh, local punk rock music, JFA, Blood Spasm. <laughs> local to Arizona. Local to Arizona, local. yeah, yeah. yeah. Tucson. Yeah, the Circle Jerks, yeah. uh, Meat Puppets. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And well, and I uh, but I've always been a little bit weird that way because I've always also been very interested in folkloric music. When I found Les Blank, mm-hmm. when I found his like body of work, what I loved about it because he has numerous films like um, Dry Wood, which is about Cajun music near mm-hmm, outside of mm-hmm. Um, he also has a Lightning Hopkins film. Mm-hmm. He also does that film. Uh, he did that film, uh, Gap Tooth Women. Um, amazing, amazing body of work about folkloric music. And and he was he made a couple different compilations of wino music from Peru, which it won me over immediately because it was all the type of music that my father and my mother listened mm-hmm. to. My mother was mm-hmm. also very much into Peruvian music. All right. Well, I think that gives us a good list of uh, of other things to listen to on our own and to search. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in for terms our of own. Teacher, I definitely, I definitely recommend looking into En el Mundo de los Pobres. That that film is on YouTube, and if you have the patience and you know Spanish, it's actually really great. It's very kind of um, vaudevillian, you know. It's like very overacted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, ah, yeah, my think, God. Yeah, think, you, know, you can like, see that in the in the few clips that you shared, sure. Yeah, and the gringo, sure. the corporate executive gringo scene is just amazing. You know, I think it's just, it's something that in Peru, I think something that isn't spoken about enough in terms of Latin America is how much internalized racism we deal with. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. how much internalized mm-hmm. struggle that we have, you know. Mm-hmm. Except yeah, and I think you world. point... Yeah, and you pointed out this question of class, right, and how right. that plays into it as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think on the on the musical side too, I think that um, the next program that we'll have with you on November twelfth will be the screening of the Les Blank film *Chulas Fronteras*, um, which again I think has an opportunity or provides an opportunity to you know for you to sort of bring us into and continue the conversation around this musical um, influence um, yeah. and the sort of merging of the Tex-Mex in this case, um, levels of influence. Um, I think um, there's the very last question is uh, just in relation to um, the opportunities that you have when you're here at Stanford and sort of what you're hoping to work on during your time um, at the university this year. It's a big question and I know that it's one that um, in certain aspects has changed um, due to the nature of um, the world we live in. Um, I think when when you know you were nominated or when you became the presidential resident artist, we had an idea for you to be on campus as much as we could, engaging with students, engaging with faculty, um, engaging with the public in various ways. And I um, I think that you know we're having to shift. This is a, a world of, 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 of newness for everybody and uncertainty around um, what the future holds. Um, but I mean, we're delighted to have you there, and um, you know are very much looking forward to the types of collaborations that we can continue to build over time. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, things change so rapidly um, and keep changing. Um, So, you know, initially my hope was to interact with the Institute for Diversity in the Arts and, Mm -hmm. and work with um, a lot of the students there that would be open to the ideas that I bring. Um, and also to work with students here in the studio that, that would mm-hmm. want internships mm-hmm. down here in LA. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I also, you know, had a hope to interact with the architecture of, of Stanford um, with a series of a body of work that I've been working on in Guadalajara a couple years ago. Um, creating kind of like jewelry essentially for, for um, buildings. Um, but, um, you know, given the circumstances, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that this program that we put together in terms of uh, an online, pivoting to the online mm-hmm. world mm-hmm. Um, has been really fruitful and interesting. And, you know, I think in terms of showing the work that I showed tonight, that Mm -hmm. was like a big hope of mine was Mm -hmm. to try to like, you know, expose a different part of my practice. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't entirely reside within um, the, the, the square, you know, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I I guess it kind of does, but it deals with time and sound and and those elements. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, I hope I'm hoping in an ideal world, mm -hmm. you know, this will slowly dissipate or end and we can resume, you know, one on one contact um, until then, you know, maybe potentially there'll just be some more online uh, formats that we can yeah. explore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank you for your flexibility in um, and <laughs> and your enthusiasm around continuing to stay engaged with us. Um, and yeah. I think that yeah, together we can be creative, and I think we can come up with uh, continuing opportunities to uh, for you to sort of get to know people and to share your practice with us. Um, and I think you know the next opportunity is November twelfth with Chulas Fronteras, um, yeah. and then in the in the new year. Um, in spring, we, we will be presenting an exhibition of your work at the Anderson Collection at Stanford. Um, and between then and now, um, everybody should stay tuned for, uh, for I think, you know, much more to come. Yeah, um, yeah we, we, you know, I, I, we plan on, on doing another uh, panel discussion in the spring. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then also regarding that exhibition, I'm working on a series of works reacting to certain elements in the Anderson Collection. And then also following on the theme of gold mm -hmm. um, and, and what we talked about with Edgar last week. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so it'll be interesting. Stay tuned for sure. Yeah, well, I'll be there and I hope everybody else will join us as well. Um, Eamon, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for sharing your work, for sharing the work of the artists that you did share. Um, thank the artists who agreed to uh, have their work shown today. Um, and it's been a real pleasure. Um, and to everybody who's in attendance, thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you at future programs. And uh, as Eamon mentioned, these uh, the full length videos of the clips that he shared with us today uh, will be made available to you uh, through the Anderson Collection website. Um, so please uh, take a look and um, spread the word. Eamon, thank you so very much. Look forward thank to you. continuing the collaboration. Likewise, likewise. Thanks so much, thank everybody. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Good night.